Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 26 The Sentence Their Voices Prevailed Pilate had gone through many phases before he had come to this. Never before in his life had he been so utterly tried and found wanting. He was Roman governor of Palestine. He had held the office for years. In the eyes then of the authorities in Rome, he was suited for the purpose. Judea was a province not easy to rule. Yet, with all his mistakes, Pilate had succeeded in ruling it. On other occasions he had done as he would wish with this people, and they had submitted. He had learnt to despise them, as he had deemed a strong Roman should. When that morning they had brought Jesus before him, he had treated them with that same contempt. When they had urged their demand, he had sent them to another, a more petty judge, to settle their claim for them. Yet all the time he had wavered, Something had told him from the first that this was no ordinary mob affair. He had seen Jesus alone, and the interview had convinced him that he was dealing with a just and innocent man. Then his contempt had begun to change to fear. Then he knew that this was a case not of justice but of hatred, and hatred is always unjust and merciless and cruel. During all this time Jesus had stood before them all, submissive, till submission became weird, saying not a word on his own behalf, making no sign that showed indignation or protest or insult or weakness, scarcely even concern. He stood there, though only one calm and self-possessed in that gathering. By his manner alone, a keen judge would have known him to be guiltless. It seemed to prove more that there was within him a power which he could use if he would, but which, for some reason that Pilate could not understand, he had refused to exercise. Pilate feared the mob howling in the street beneath him. He feared, too, the silent being standing on the steps beside him, the like of whom he had never had to judge in all his experience of men. He dared not yet pass the final sentence. Before he yielded, he must save himself from the consequences of an unjust act, whether from Caesar in Rome or from this mysterious king, whose kingdom was not of this world. Like all unbelievers, Pilate was superstitious. Brave it as he might, in his heart he feared he knew not what. Meanwhile, the clamor in the street grew louder. It had risen so as to be threatening, and must needs be appeased. It was true he could have turned his soldiers on the crowd and dispersed it, but he hesitated. He had done something of the kind before, and had been made to repent his indiscretion. These Asiatics were a people that did not forgive or forget. Somehow he must humor them. At the same time, he must justify himself in his own mind. So far as he could, he would free himself from all responsibility. This he had endeavored to do during all the morning, since there now seemed no escape, since in the end it seemed inevitable that he must speak the final word, he would throw the responsibility for that word on others. He argued with himself. These violent disturbers of the peace insisted. It was his duty to keep the peace, especially at such a time as this, when Jerusalem was full of strangers from everywhere. And was not the public peace of far greater importance than the life of any single man? Let Jesus go free and many lives might be lost in the disturbance, almost certainly the life of Jesus himself in any case. Let him die, and many would be saved, peace would be restored, and the paschal season would pass off tranquilly. He would yield. It would be better in the end. Thus did Pilate, by another route, arrive at the conclusion of Caiaphas. It were better that one man should die for the people. But his yielding should be with all the formality that became one in his position. A Roman judge, whatever he might decree, must not be accused of injustice. A Roman judge could do no wrong. So he went through an empty form. 
As Caiaphas long ago had settled the scruples of the priests by the invention of a formula, so would Pilate settle the scruples of his own worldly conscience by the invention of a form. He would wash his hands of the whole affair. He little dreamt that his act would establish a metaphor for all time to come. He called an attendant boy. He bade him bring water in a basin, as if for some ablution which would have seemed nothing strange. As he put his hands into the water, he spoke words which made his action symbolic. He had already declared his prisoner innocent. Now he would absolve himself from all guilt. If guilt rested on anyone, it lay on those who were driving him to do what he abhorred. And Pilate, seeing that he prevailed nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, having taken water, washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. Pilate, the poor worldling, keeping up appearances at any cost before the eyes of men, the coward affecting to be brave, the anxious affecting to be careless, the grossly cruel affecting to be just, the brutally cruel affecting to be humane, the guilty affecting to be honest, the self-seeking affecting to be eaten up with zeal for law and order. Whatever he may be in his own heart and conscience, outwardly his hands must be clean. He must stand well and be approved before the tribunal of men. We cannot hate Pilate. He is too weak and worldly wise for hatred. But it is hard not to despise him for a cunning self-deceiver, one who in the end might persuade himself that any evil deed was good. Yet when we condemn him, how many of us at the same time pronounce in some degree our own condemnation? The world is a liar and a deceiver in nothing more contemptible than in its constant affectation of truth and honesty in the service of men. Of all the characters in the Passion, Pilate has always had most imitators. Yet even Pilate little suspected the response his self-exculpation would evoke. He had declared himself innocent in the eyes of men. His victorious adversaries in the street below had no such scruples. Let men think of them what they liked. They would have this man's blood at any cost, though it were to be upon them for all time. If that were all Pilate wanted, that he might pass the final sentence, let him have it. He had shifted the guilt upon their shoulders. They had understood the travesty he had gone through well enough. They would willingly accept the burden. The cry they poured out is one of the most terrible prophecies which cannot have been invented. Its significance is too deep for any man to have dared. Its fulfillment too manifest for anyone to doubt. And all the people answering said, His blood be upon us and upon our children. The words were the closing of another act in the drama. For a moment there was a dread silence, as if the crowd itself were appalled at the self-condemnation it had uttered. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth to me from the earth. It was misery indeed, cold and clammy, that enshrouded their hearts. It must be killed. The drama must go on. By noise, if by no other means, the cry in the heart must be stifled in the crowd. Men talked loudly to one another, boasting, careless, losing themselves in ribaldry. What mattered any consequence? They had gained their end. Up above, around the seat of judgment, officials moved to and fro. Documents were produced and duly signed. Barabbas was brought out and handed over to the crowd, wondering what this confusion meant, how he came to be the hero of this heated moment. He knew himself to be a convicted murderer, and therefore the hand of every man should be against him. He knew himself to have been condemned as a provoker of sedition, and therefore could expect no mercy from the Roman governor. He had been cast into prison, tried, proved guilty, and condemned, and could only await the hour of his execution probably that very day. Yet now, on a sudden, 
He was told that his people had demanded his release and that the Roman governor had consented. What had happened? Had a revolution come about while he had been in prison? Had the Roman been made to yield before the threats of Jewry? Had the kingdom come? But even if it had, what could have made his people choose him for its favor? Murderers were never forgiven. Highwaymen were always feared. Such kindness could be nothing but a mockery. Barabbas, the son of the father. Was there no one who noticed the significance of that name?